Well, to those of you who prayed for our Revival Summer Camp a couple weeks back, I just want to say thank you. It was one of our best Revival Summer Camps ever. Um, God really answered those prayers. He sustained us through the heat. There was a lot of preparation and all this stuff that went into it, but I think the most valuable thing was you guys praying for us, so thank you for that. As I think back on going to Lake Havasu with a bunch of 12 to 18-year-olds, there was a lot of preparation that went into that. And you know that, and you can imagine as the youth pastor, I'm trying to prep them and say, guys, you don't understand. It's, it's really hot at Lake Havasu. It's hotter than you think, so you need to prepare. And as you would expect, some people listened, other people didn't listen, and they were uh, seeing the medical team pretty soon after when they had headaches and things weren't going well because they were dehydrated. And that heat is strong, and of all the things to prepare for, that heat was one of the big things. I remember I left here, I was driving Alexander's car, and we were driving, and it was like 76 degrees here. I'm thinking, oh, it's going to be great. We make it to Riverside, it's maybe 86 degrees. Okay, just getting a little hotter. Make it to the high desert, it's like 104. I'm like, well, the day's still young, maybe it'll get a little hotter. And then you go down into Needles, and it's like 112. I thought, it can't get much worse. <laughs> oh, but it can. As we're driving down the road, that main, the main road in Lake Havasu, I was seeing the temperature, the thermometer go from 117, 118, 119. And every time it hits a new degree, I'm announcing it to my wife, Alexandra, it's, it's one, 119 now. One ni-. And she's like, all right, chill out. Um, <laughs> and I got all excited. And then by the time that I pulled into the parking space and walked out to the cove, it was 121 degrees on the thermometer. And I'm thinking, is it going to be that hot though? I mean, you know, the car's been sitting in the sun for a long time. We've been driving. Is it overheating? I step outside and I say, yeah, it's actually 121 degrees. It is pretty hot. You ever feel that feeling when you get out and it feels like you're just like hit in the face with a bunch of heat? That's how it felt. And our students who did not prepare, they got hit in the face with some heat the moment they stepped out of those buses. We got to prepare for the heat as Christians. You know that God's word is constantly telling God's people, we are going to face the heat of trials, of persecution, of a million other evils that we will face in this world. God's word is constantly saying God's people need to prepare to feel the heat. I know that as we talk about a topic like suffering and trials, that there are many people in our church right now that are in the middle of the heat. There are people at our church right now that cannot be here because they're in the hospital receiving treatment for for various kinds of sicknesses and diseases. You know, there's people from our church who are right now having their first Sunday with the Lord because they've just passed on from from death to eternal life. I know that we are facing trials of various kinds, and I also know that if we've been facing trials in the past, God has more things ahead of us that we need to face with a strong, resolute faith. That's why for the next two weeks, myself and Pastor Matt are going to be preaching through the beginning of the book of James, which is constantly telling us, have a strong faith. This topic is so important because whether you're in the heat of trial right now or not, God's word is constantly promising us we're going to face the heat of trial. With that in mind, I'd love for you to open up a Bible to James chapter 1, and I want us to see together what God's word has to say for Christians who are in the heat of trial Because this book of James is not written to people in peacetime, so to speak. This book is written at a time where a pastor is writing to his people from his church, and they're not at home anymore. This is from James, the brother of the Lord. This is James, the brother of Jude, the son of Mary and Joseph, right? This This is someone who is close to Jesus, and he's writing to his Christian brothers and sisters from his church, problem is his church was not meeting normally because they were not in Jerusalem because these people were dispersed. Acts 12 says that there was a persecution that happened when one of the Herods killed James, the brother of John, and there was a vacuum of leadership that needed to to be filled. And it seems like James, the brother of Jesus, steps up and fills that role in Jerusalem. That's why by the time we reach Acts 15, as we just studied recently with Pastor Mike, James is that senior pastor, that uh, main guy who's leading the church in Jerusalem. This is that James writing to his people who were not there. I want you to imagine what this would be like. This would be like Pastor Mike writing you guys a letter, and we're all spread out. We're in different places because it's not safe to be a Christian here anymore. That's the trial. That's the elephant in the room, so to speak. So if you're going to open this book and say, what does James have to say for these Christians? That's the first thing you're thinking. 
What about the, the biggest trial we've ever faced in our lives that we're going through right now? What does God's word have to say for us? James 1, verse 2. Here's what God's word has for us. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Right? That command to count something all joy is completely counterintuitive. It's unnatural. It's not how we feel. He's telling them to change their way of thinking because, verse 4, you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. There's something that's better on the other end of the trial that these Christians can look through the trial and say, there's something better here at the end that I can look forward to. Counting it all joy. The word count is like a accounting word. You got to take something from one category and consider it to be something else. Same word that Paul uses in Philippians 3. He counted his gain as loss. It's a mental exercise. You're moving something from one category to another. Sometimes we read this so fast that we see all joy, and you see that word all, we're like, oh, is that talking about all situations that we should be joyful? That command comes elsewhere. That's in Philippians 4.4. 4. That's in 1 Thessalonians 5, to rejoice always. It's in Romans chapter 12. But that's not what this is saying. What this is saying, the word all, is modifying the word joy. So he's describing a type of joy. What type of joy should Christians have when they meet trials of various kinds? All joy, great joy, unmixed, unalloyed, pure joy. When they meet trials of various kinds. I don't know if you've gone through a trial, but it doesn't usually feel like you met it by um, shaking its hand and saying, hello, nice to meet you. Uh, you're my trial? Okay, that's usually not how it feels when we meet trials. Well, this word meeting was used three times in the New Testament, once here, but it's never translated meet other than here. It's in Luke chapter 10 when Jesus tells the story of the parable of the, the Good Samaritan. You know, that man was walking down the road and he was met by robbers, right? The, the ESV says that the robbery it fell upon him. That's the, the concept of these trials. That's how it feels. It feels like we're walking down life and the trial just comes upon us like robbers on a road. The word's also used in Acts 27 to describe Paul's ship that hit a reef. In the ESV, it's translated to strike the reef. That's what it feels like when we meet trials. We're not shaking its hand saying, oh, nice to meet you, trial. It's like robbers have fallen upon us. It's like our ship has struck a reef. That's the word, to meet trials of various kinds. Various, it means multicolored, multifaceted, complex. That's how our trials feel, complex, different. It says you can meet them with joy if you have a firm, confident assurance. Verse three says, for you know, you know by experience that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. So I understand that preaching this sermon to a group like this is full of a lot of Christians who are seasoned, who have gone through trials of various kinds. I want you to hear this today, that you know, because of the trials that you face, you know that the testing of your faith has resulted in steadfastness. The word steadfastness in the Greek is hupomene. It's the word Pastor Mike talks about all the time, where you come underneath a load. It's not the same as saying, it is what it is. A lot of people think steadfastness or strength is just being passive and saying, it is what it is. That's not the word picture. The word picture is you're coming underneath a trial and you're bearing it day in and day out, but you have the strength to bear it. That's what this endurance is, this steadfastness. Verse four says, don't miss the point of all this. Don't just go through a trial to get strong. You need to do something. The second command of the text is the word let, where it says, and let steadfastness have its full effect. We could go through trials and we could be strong on the other side, yet we could miss the point if we don't let that strength and endurance lead to the perfect effect. The word full is the same word as perfect. So he's kind of doing a little dad joke there. He's using a little pun, using the same word in two different ways there. He's saying, let the trials and the steadfastness have its perfect effect that you may be perfect, complete, lacking in nothing. That we as Christians would go through trials for the purpose of God shaping, refining, testing us so that we would be the Christians that he wants us to be for many reasons. But one of the reasons is to face the next trial with even more faith and more strength. All of this is really hard, especially if you're going through a trial right now, as many of us are. If you're going through a trial, this is difficult because this is saying when these trials encounter you, when you strike the reef of a trial, or when these trials come upon you like robbers on a road, what is our natural response? It's not joy. It's not patience. It's not endurance. We have to do something. We have to decide to think differently. That's what the word consider means. You've got to decide to think differently 
about these trials. The next two weeks, I, I hope that this text And the next text is an encouragement that you and I would all decide ahead of time, before the trial happens, that when we see the trial, when we meet the trial, that we'd face it with a joyful attitude because we know something, because we're confident that God has brought the trial, that God will get us through the trial, and God has a good purpose for the end of the trial, no matter how big or how strong. All of this is only possible if we have the right mindset, if we think correctly about our trials. So before we get anywhere else, I want us to write this down for point number one. If you're taking notes, I want you to think biblically about your trials. If we're just going to take a step back and say, why do we face hardships? What hard things do we go through? What's our natural response? We got to think biblically about it or else we'll just think naturally about it. We'll think in a fleshly way about it. It reminds me of when I was driving back from Revival. I stopped through Barstow, coming back home, um, was getting gas. And I made the mistake of just going to whatever gas station I saw first. So I just went to whatever gas station I saw first, um, get out of the car. It's right, still hot. And it's not every day that 105 is colder than where you came from, but that's what's happening that day. Get out of the car, you know, do the thing. You put your card in the reader, reads the chip, you put in your pin, and then it said, see cashier inside. I'm like, I'm, no, I'm not going to do that. So then I try again. Instead of doing the, the debit, I, I put in the zip code, thinking, okay, we'll just charge it as credit. I don't know what's going on. What does it say? See cashier inside. I said, Alexandra, get back in the car. We're going somewhere else. So then we pulled to a different stall in the same gas station, because I'm thinking, these things aren't, they're not that smart, right? They're not communicating with each other. Put the card in, put the pin in, felt like I was flying. I thought, this is good. It says, see cashier inside. So I said, Alexandra, get in the car. We're going to a different gas station. So we went to a different, this is all because I didn't want to talk to the cashier. Maybe I was just, revival drained me or something. I'm like, we're going to a different gas station. But I'm glad we did because as I'm going to the other gas station, I get a text on my phone from Chase Bank that says, we believe fraud has been committed on your card. I'm like, I get it. I didn't know I had to call Chase Bank and warn them I was going through the international travel of Barstow. I didn't know that was something I had to tell them about. But I understand, I mean, I'm usually not, you know, spending money at a Barstow gas station. I guess I get it, right? And I had to text yes and, like, go in and change the settings and say, no, it's good. But I didn't want to take the risk, so we used Alexander's car. So there you go. Uh, At the next gas station. I didn't want to take the risk. But it works now. It's all good. I know you're worried about that, but it's okay. It works. I want you to think about what happened there. Something happened with the algorithm, and, you know, Chase Bank said, hey, we think fraud's being committed on your card, so the alarms went off, right? There's a notification that went off. They said, something's not right here, and it stopped it from working. I had to go in and manually change the settings and say, nope, nope, it's me, it's all good. Something had to happen. I had to manually do that, and that's the same idea that he's giving here when it says, count it all joy. Naturally, how do we respond to trials? The alarms go up. We say, something's wrong, this is not right, something's wrong. The alarms go off, right? Here's what we have to do. You have to go in and manually change the settings of your thinking. That's what count it all joy means. That you go into your thinking and say, I'm going to think differently about this. There's three basic, fundamental Christian biblical truths that I want to give you this morning that might help you think biblically about trials. If you've been a Christian for a long time, I know these are basic, but I hope it's helpful to think these through again. First of all, truth number one, I want you to know that Christians are promised trials. We're not promised exemption from trials. That's super important for us to understand. Some of us fall into the trap of thinking, I'm a Christian, this shouldn't happen to me. I'm a Christian, this shouldn't happen with my finances. I'm a Christian, this shouldn't happen to my marriage. I'm a Christian, this shouldn't happen with my kids. And sometimes we think we're exempt from the trials. Obviously, if you've been a Christian for a long time and you've gone through trials, you know. You don't need me to tell you that we're not exempt from trials. You know by experience that we're not exempt. But I want to remind you of what the Bible says about this. Do you know what Abraham and Moses and Elijah, do you know what they all had in common? And Jeremiah and the the apostles of the New Testament, and Jesus himself, do you know what they all have in common? Suffering, 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 weeping, crying, being upset, things not going their way, their families turning on them, people not understanding them, backstabbing. I mean, think about the life of David and Ahithophel. You've got all these examples in the Bible of godly people being betrayed, being hurt, being persecuted, that if we stand in the line, the long line of saints from the Old Testament and the New, we need to expect that trials will come. 
There's the natural trials. There's the trials that everyone's going to face, like sickness, like death. And there's also the trials that Jesus specifically promises his people will face. Do you remember what he said in John 15? When he said, don't be surprised when the world hates you. In fact, you should expect that because remember, the world hated me first. Disciple's not greater than its master. Right? Don't get into your thinking that you're going to escape opposition from the world when Jesus didn't. Just be careful thinking that. Of all the examples in the Bible, Jesus is the most helpful. If you think about the trials that he faced, do you remember the, the entire center of what we believe as Christians? Do you know what surrounds the, the suffering of Jesus, the passion of Jesus? He suffered on the cross for us. He didn't just suffer on the cross, he suffered before the cross. He suffered as he was going to the cross, so much so that Hebrews 4 says that we can go to him in our time of need because he is a sympathetic high priest. You feel aches and pains, he felt aches and pains. You feel abandonment, he felt abandonment. Like we can go to the God man directly in prayer as our high priest because he knows. He experienced what we experienced. One commentator looking at James 1 2 said, The right perspective on trials is not to look at the trial, but to look through the trial. We see that all through scripture, especially the example of Jesus. In Hebrews chapter 12, the author says, remember what Jesus did when he faced his greatest trial. This is Hebrews 12, verse 2. It says, we should look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising or looking down on the shame, and now is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. You know, when you read the Gospels, when you open up your Bible in the morning, when you think of what Jesus did, one of the purposes of thinking of the life of Jesus is to remember, look what he went through. Look how he suffered. He suffered righteously. The only sinless person who shouldn't have had anything wrong with his body or his mind or his family or his situation, he suffered, and how did he do it? He suffered well. He fulfilled all righteousness. Remember, truth number one, Christians are promised trials. We're not exempt from trials. Truth number two, this might be the hardest one. We need to remember as Christians that God wisely and sovereignly brings trials into our lives for a variety of reasons. That's complicated, but remember that God wisely and sovereignly is the one who brings the trial into our life for a variety of reasons. Our trials are on God's calendar, so to speak. They're usually not on ours. We're usually not expecting them, but they're on God's calendar. He knows. They're planned out in his wise, sovereign will. Reminds me of a surgery that we had on our calendar. Uh, my wife and I had to go in and get um, a surgery for our daughter, Eden. She had a, a problem in her mouth. She had a really bad tongue tie, so much so that her mouth did not open nearly as much as it should have, so she had four places in her mouth where there was tongue tie. Up here, up here, down here, and it was just everywhere. Lip tie, tongue tie, and then two buckle ties. So we got it checked out, and they said, uh, you need surgery. You need to go in and get it done. You could either get it um, cut or get it burned. And they said the bur when you burn it, it, it heals a little bit better usually. So that's what we did. Remember, it was February 14th, Valentine's Day. We take this little girl, a little four-month-old Eden Hope. We take her in, and she gets her surgery, right? I remember Alexandra went in. I was doing something else. I was working outside, and I remember she called me. She said, you need to get in here right now. So I'm thinking, okay, something's wrong. I go in, and there was nothing wrong. The surgery went fine, but, I mean, this little girl is just hysterical. She's screaming, and she's crying. And actually, what they told us to do, said the only way that this is going to work is if every night and every morning you take this solution, you put it in her mouth, and you constantly peel back, constantly peel back the wound. You gotta take your thumb and put it under her tongue and under her uh, lip tie, tongue tie, and the buckle tie. You gotta open it up and stretch it. And every night and every morning, you gotta do these stretches. And every time, it's just she's hysterical day in and day out. When, I, when everything is fine, it's like, oh, it's time for the, for the stretches. And she'd even start to pick it up when we go into a room and we go in there and she would know it's coming and she'd start to cry. And I finally you know, understood as a father, like, oh man, this is, this is so hard. Right? And I'm putting her through this. I'm the one who's opening the wound. I'm doing it. And she's crying. If I were to ask her at the moment, she's not very able to talk at three or four months old, but if I was to ask her, how much do you like mom and dad right now? How much do you, they love you. The natural response is they hate me. They're hurting me. 
Look what they have put me through. Obviously, the reason we did that is not because we hate her. It's because we love her. We thought that there's wisdom in fixing that problem now while she's a really little girl than waiting until she's older to get this done or waiting to do some kind of speech therapy. We're thinking it's better for her to get this done now and go through the pain now, even if it means a day in, day out, opening up of that fresh wound. I know that in wisdom, it is better for her to get this done now. It wasn't on her calendar, but it was on our calendar, wisely ordained. Do you know that the trials that God brings into our life are similar to that? That even if it feels like when we wake up in the morning, it's like a fresh wound is opened again and again. Do you know that the trials that God brings into our life are wise? They're wisely ordained for our good. They're not for our evil. They're for our good. We see people in the Bible who go through things that was for their good, even the trial that Job went through. You remember we just read Job? Remember how he lost his, his kids? He lost his assets, he lost his business, he lost everything in a single afternoon and it felt like the trial was just hitting him, wave after wave. Job 1.20 says, then Job, when he heard the news, arose, he tore his robe, he shaved his head, he fell on the ground and he worshiped. And he said, naked I came from my mother's womb and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And in all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. What kind of faith did he have before that? What kind of preparation did he have? The book of Job does not tell us, other than he was a righteous man. He was a teleos, perfect man. He was equipped for every good work. He was ready to face it. And when the trial came, he had strong faith. We see that in Job 13. He says, though he slay me, yet I will continue to praise him. Job 19, he says, I know that my redeemer lives and I know that I will see him face to face. I'll talk to him. God puts us through trials for a variety of reasons. It was not any sin that Job committed, although his friends thought it was. Remember, all of his friends are trying to accuse him, saying, what kind of secret sin were you doing? Why God punished you? It wasn't for that, but it was in God's kind, wise providence that he brought that about to show you and to help me and to help you as we read that book. God has a purpose for our trials, even if we can't see it at the time. That's one reason God brings them. He said he wisely brings them for a variety of reasons. The reason is because they're not always brought about with an indirect connection to sin, like many of our trials are. Another way to put it is, sometimes God does bring trials that are directly attached to our sinful behavior. We call that discipline. That's why whenever we're in a trial, we can't always say, oh, I'm playing victim here. Sometimes we cause the trials that we're in. Sometimes the trials that we go through are discipline, but even in that, if you're a Christian, every time God disciplines you, do you understand that the reason he's doing that is for your good? Even in the pain, Hebrews 12 says that all discipline, while we're going through it, seems unpleasant, but in the end, it bears the peaceful fruit of righteousness, of holiness, God disciplines us so that we might share in his holiness. So even the pain that we experience that is directly connected to our sin, it's still out of God's love. See, that's an amazing truth. Sometimes we forget. Some of us who might be in discipline, we might start to do exactly the opposite of what Job did and say, why is God being so mean to me? Even if we're being disciplined, some of us probably are at this point. Maybe we're going through a season of, of discipline. You understand that God is trying to make you share in his holiness? He loves you even in the discipline? 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, there's no temptation or trial that has overtaken you that's not common to man. God is faithful. He won't let you be tempted or tried beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Second truth is God wisely and sovereignly brings trials into our lives for different reasons. Truth number three, hopefully, is the most encouraging to you. It's this, that God cares deeply for his people and he never leaves and he's never absent in our pain. That's truth number three, that God is one who cares deeply as our father, as our shepherd is sometimes how he's called. Psalm 23, he's called our shepherd. See, David said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Then he gets to the worst part in verse four. He says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, death is all around me, death in my family, baby death that we're staring in the face. What does he say? I will fear no evil because you are with me. You never leave 
never forsake me. He says, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. God's protective agent and God's disciplining agent. The rod and the staff, they comfort David through the trial when death is all around him. Death is obviously, it's like the, the big one. It's the big trial. Whether you right now are facing death and thinking, I've got three months to live, I've got six months to live, I've got however long God has for me to live. If death is what you're staring in the face, God's word is constantly saying, hey, Christian, be strong. Take courage. Paul said it like this in 2 Timothy 4.18. He said, the Lord will rescue me from every evil deed, and he will bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. That's not an insensitive platitude that Paul gives. He says, I know that God will bring me safely home. How was Paul brought home? Do you remember church history? Do you remember how he was brought home? He was brought home through a a brutal execution. Yet he says, I know God's going to bring me safely home. Whether it be chronic pain, whether it be a diagnosis that you're expecting to take your life soon, God's going to bring you home. That's what he's doing. He uses even the evil and the painful things to get you where he wants to get you. It might not be death for you. It might just be a a, a broken heart. It might just be dashed hopes and disappointed dreams. It might be things that you thought were going to work out that didn't work out. Things that hurt you, right? Psalm 34 gives us great encouragement. It says in Psalm 34, verse 18, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted, and he saves the crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the the Lord delivers him out of all of them. You remember who our God is? Isaiah 57 says that our God dwells and he inhabits eternity. That's who he is, but he doesn't just live in eternity. He doesn't just live in the highest heavens. He dwells with the lowly, with the brokenhearted, with the penitent, with his people, those of us who've repented of our sins, who feel the weight of our sins, who go to God for refuge and forgiveness. God is our salvation. He's our protector. He's our fortress. We just read it in the daily Bible reading today. Love how Psalm 62, 5 puts it. It says, For God alone, O my soul, wait in silence, for my hope is in him. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God rests my salvation and my glory. My rock, my refuge is God. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. That was true then, that's true now. Scriptures are full of promises that are meant to equip you as you face the trials. One of my favorites comes in Psalm 125. It's this word picture about the person who trusts in the Lord. Psalm 125, one says that those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved, but abides forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people from this time forth and forevermore. You're included in that. I love that word picture because if you've ever been to Jerusalem, you know it's you got this hill right in the middle, Mount Zion, where the temple used to stand. A lot of people look at the geography of Jerusalem and say it's like a, a head with a crown around it because all these hills surround that main hill. It's a lower hill, but it's surrounded by these, these hills and these mountains around it. That's the picture, that God surrounds the heart of his people. That we're like that thing right in the middle, Mount Zion, which cannot be moved, but God comes around us and he surrounds us with protection and with mercy and with grace and with care. A care that's able to do something about our problems. A care that will bring us safely home. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. It doesn't say it's not hard. It says that we can meet them with joy because we know something. Verse 3 in our text says that you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. That one truth is supposed to get them from thinking about the trial to think through the trial to look on what is on the other side of the trial, which is steadfastness, endurance, fortitude. I think our problem, if we're going to try to apply this, is not that you don't believe that. I think most people would say, I believe that people go through hard things, they get strong, they get tough. We believe that. We see that with our hands when they get calluses. We see that with muscles when they get resistance, they get stronger. We see that in nature, we see that in the natural world. But I think the problem for us is usually this, that we don't value steadfastness as much as we should. We might believe, yeah, I can go through a trial and I know I'll be stronger, but I'd rather not be stronger. I'd rather avoid the trial 
to begin with. That makes sense. I think if we're going to apply this and count it all joy, we need to do this. Point number two, I want you to value the steadfastness of a refined faith. I want you to value it with all your heart. Value what comes on the other side of a trial. That's why he uses the word the testing of your faith. It's not the same word as trial. It's a different word. It's a word that we see in the Septuagint, the Old Testament, right? When um, the Old Testament was translated into Greek, we see it often referring to the refiner's fire, right? Like when metal goes through something hot and the impurities are taken off of it. So that's what the trials do as the testing of our faith. We need to see all of our trials as testing our faith, refining our faith, making you a stronger Christian woman, making you a stronger Christian man, equipping you to be the mother that you need to be for your kids, the father that you need to be for your kids, the grandfather, the grandmother, whoever you are in relation to other people. That's what the trials are supposed to do to equip us. I ran into a lady once, it was a weird situation where I met her, but she had paid a lot of money to get tested on her abilities. I was golfing, so this, this story is, okay, I just got to tell you this. This story, you're not going to believe it, but it's true, 100% true. How it started was I was playing golf by myself, so that part you might believe. But I was on the golf course playing golf by myself, and it was this golf course that's near an airport, and there's a lot of skydivers that, that jump down, and so I see these skydivers a lot of times when I'm playing out there, and I, I see this one skydiver, and it kind of amazed me because I thought, wow, they're like coming right for the golf course. That's so interesting. So then I, I kind of play the 15th hole. I see this skydiver. I'm like, that's kind of cool. Like, they're coming right there. And I'm standing on the 16th tee. I've got a seven iron, wind in my back, trying to hit a cut, trying to hold it up against the wind. Remember, sorry, this is true. Um, the skydiver comes like right down. And I'm thinking, they're, they're coming right here. I need to wait. So I waited to hit. I'm standing there on the tee box looking. The skydiver comes like literally as high as the ceiling is right here. They come and they land. And I think like, wow, that was the weirdest thing. And I just kept playing, right? Because I'm thinking, why would they land on the golf course? So I play 16. 17 comes back around. I was playing the 17th hole, hit my drive. And as I'm driving in the golf cart, I, I look to my right and the person is there waving me down. And that was the first time I thought, oh, they shouldn't be there. Like, this was an accident. So then I go over. I feel bad, right? <laughs> I go over, and I meet this person. It's like a 27, 28-year-old lady who's the first time she's ever skydived by herself. Her radio is broken. She has no phone. So I'm like, do you need help? And she's like, yeah, I need help. Do you have a phone? So we're packing up her parachute into the back of the golf cart. And she's using my phone, and, you know, I, hi, my name's John, hi, my name's such and such, and we're, we're, we're going, and she's using my phone, and I, she said, do you know where the airport is? I'm like, yeah, it's like three miles over there. So she calls the airport, she calls the skydiving place, they come to the clubhouse and pick her up, but we're on 17. So I said, we're going to finish, okay? Is that okay? <laughs> so we finished. I finished. Um, she's like, it's going to take 20 minutes. I said, great, Perfect. So I had a playing partner for about 20 minutes there, this lady, um, and we're talking, and I'm asking her about this whole skydiving thing, like, how'd you get into it? She was like a, like a medical student at you know, UC San Diego, she's super smart, she's got all this stuff going on, and you know, I said, how did you get into this? She's like, well, I just really wanted to be like one of those superheroes. I saw these people jumping out of uh, planes, and I thought, like, I'd really want to do that. And I said, is this like expensive to do? I've always kind of wondered. She said, oh, it kind of is, because I'm in this program, or I have to do 25 successful jumps in order to get licensed, right? And she said, it is expensive. And I asked her, I said, okay, okay. So you say 25 jumps. You said 25 successful jumps. Um, <laughs> and she said, well, I guess I have to jump 26 times now. <laughs> because she missed the airport by a long way. <laughs> Skydiving is dangerous enough where I think you should be tested before you be an instructor, right? I don't want to strap myself to this girl who's like, she got really lost the first time. She needs a lot of testing. It was worth it. It's worth the money for her to get tested. It was valuable to her. Look at that. It's only a, a few thousand dollars, but it is kind of a lot to get that license, to go through all those 25 jumps. The question for us is, how much do we value the testing of our faith? How much is it worth to us? Is our comfort worth more to us than the testing of our faith? Peter says in 1 Peter 1, 6, that the testing of our faith is more precious than gold that perishes. First Peter 1, if you're quick, you can turn there real fast. First Peter 1, 6 says, In this you rejoice, 
though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it's tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Getting the attention back to Christ. Verse 8 says, Though you have not seen him face to face, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe, you trust in him, and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. That kind of faith that says, I know the test in my faith is more valuable than gold. It's expensive, it hurts, it costs a lot of pain, it costs a lot of time, but I know it's worth it. I want you to think through some ways that it is worth it. We need a tested faith when we stand up and face the opposition of the world. Do you know how valuable it's going to be in the day that you stand up and you are accused of things in the marketplace that you did not do because you're a Christian? You need strong faith for that. If you're going to endure, if you're going to preach the gospel, if you're going to stand and say, this word right here, this Bible is God's word, you better have some strong faith. You better strengthen that faith by study. We need strong faith there. When you face relational hardships, abandonment, backstabbing, betrayal, treachery, heartbreak, you need strong faith. You need to go find your comfort in the Lord. You need to be strong even before that happens. When you face battles over your health, when you have extreme pain, chronic pain, you need strong faith that God has a resurrection body that he's waiting to give you, that all the aches and the pains and the hurt is gonna go away. When you face the hour of death and you stare the grave in the face, you need a strong faith. Some of you have done that, You've stared death in the face, and now you're a different Christian because of what you went through. Because you went through saying, I could die from this. Let's get my house in order. Let's get ready to meet the Lord. Many of you are different people because of the cancer and because of the heart attacks and because of the bad injuries that you've been through. Some of you are different people because of that. Although nobody would wish those on anybody, can you look back and say, wow, God did something through that trial. I'm a different person because of that. I want you to think, what kind of person would you be without the trials that you've faced in your life? I know this, you'd be less godly. You would be less patient. You would be less holy. You would be more proud. You would be more entitled. You'd be more selfish. You'd be more anxious. Right? If you had never faced those trials. One of the things that trials and refining of our faith does is it strips us of a self-sufficiency or a trust in ourself. Some people put it like this, that it strips us of like the illusion of control, like we're in charge, like we've got everything in our life figured out. Trials take that away from us. That's what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 1, 8 through 10. He says that we experienced a harsh trial when we were doing ministry in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despised of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. But he can look back on the trial and say this, that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. We went through that trial, and now Paul can look back and say, I know why it was. We are less self-sufficient. We are more God-sufficient now. We are more dependent on him because of what we went through. Because we know what it's like to have serious pain in our lives, we know that I'm dependent on God for every breath. Because we go through the loss of loved ones, we know I'm ready to go home. There's a strengthening and resolving of our faith that happens because of this. It doesn't just make us stronger, it also makes us more tender. In fact, that's what Paul says earlier in that text. 2 Corinthians 1, 3, when he's explaining this trial, at the end he says it was make, to make us not rely on ourselves, but at the beginning of the text, he says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our afflictions so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so also through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. Many of you are put through trials partially because God wants to use you to help the next person who is going through the trial right now. Paul says that we have a greater sympathy and a greater capacity to show comfort and care for people because of what we went through. Some of you have gone through intense pain that, I, that I've never experienced, and now you are equipped in such a way that you can now help these people right now that are going through serious pain, whether it be with families, whether it be with the loss of a kid, loss of a spouse. 
whether it be through physical pain, some of you who've been through it and are in it right now, you are going to be the instrument that God is going to use to bring comfort to his people. You wouldn't be that without your trial. You couldn't do that without your trial. You're equipped in a way that I'm not equipped for that trial. Hopefully at the end, all that leads us to what Asaph says in Psalm 73, verse 25, he says, whom have I in heaven but you, God? And there's nothing on earth I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. If that can be our resolve, as we look back on trials, that's exactly where God wants us to be. That's why James in our text says, let steadfastness have its full effect. Don't stop it short. Sometimes we go through trials and we're strong, but we don't let that strength lead us in the direction that God wants to bring us. Sometimes we go through trials and instead of becoming compassionate and sympathetic and helpful, the other response that we could have to trials is bitterness, is anger, questioning God. We need to make sure we let these trials have their perfect and complete effect in us that we be more righteous. That word perfect is the word teleos, the word which means to be well-equipped, perfect, just right, exactly what God wants. It says that we would be perfect, that we'd be lacking nothing, we'd be complete, that we'd be godly. Let steadfastness have its full effect. Point number three is this. I want you to use every trial to grow in godliness. That's what we need. Stronger faith, we need to use every trial to grow in godliness. That's point number three. Use every trial to grow in godliness. Becoming perfect, complete, mature, exactly right, it's a really hard thing. That's why in every trial, we can rely on what God's word says. We can look to promises like the ones that God gives in Romans 8 for Christians. Remember what he says in Romans 8, 28, about all things? He says, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Right. We gotta, first of all, define love God, and we gotta define what the good is. But it's exactly what Joseph said in Genesis 50, 20. When his brothers sold him into slavery, he said, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Some of you will go through things this week or this year where people literally are sinning against you. With an evil intention, they will do something wrong to you and sinful to you, and is it fair? No. Is it wrong? Yes. But, like Joseph, we can say, you meant it for evil, yeah, but God even meant that evil thing that you did to me, he meant it for good. He meant it for the good of his people. He meant it for the good. What's the main good? Well, if you know Romans 8.28, I hope you know Romans 8.29. It defines what does this goodness, this end goal look like. It says, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed into the image of his son. What's the good thing that God, for sure, in every trial, wants in us? He wants you, he wants me, to be more like his son. He wants us to respond like Christ would respond. He wants to have patience when we would otherwise be angry. He wants us to be a peacemaker when we would otherwise engage in the fight with that person. All of that is important, but the text goes on, he says, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. It's like, why do we go through pain? Well, because God's doing something in us. Well, who's it for? Well, yeah, it's for our good, but you know who ultimately all of our pain is for? It goes back to God. It's for God. How can I glorify God in this season of pain? How can I glorify God in this trial? Because I know he's using all these situations, the hardship, and I don't want you to dismiss this to say, oh, it's only the big things. When you stub your toe this week, when you get cut off in traffic, right? those might be micro trials, really small, but can you think, I want to use every little thing. I want to exhibit Christ-like character. When every time where I would have been upset, where I would have exploded in anger, every time I wouldn't have been self-controlled, I want to show self-control, I want to show restraint. I want to show love to the people in my life who are constantly egging me on to not love them. I want to show restraint, I want to show love, Christ-likeness. That's what God wants to do. Use every trial to grow in godliness. The word perfect, complete, lacking in nothing, gives us the idea of a, a soldier or a person who's been tested, ready for battle, ready to do the work. That's kind of the picture, right? Completely equipped, has all the armor they need, has all the training they need. It's the picture that Paul uses for Timothy in 2 Timothy 2, 
where he says, hey, yeah, you're going to be a pastor in Ephesus? Okay, you've got a lot of things that you need to get ready for. You need to share in sufferings as a good soldier of Christ. You need to compete and work like an athlete who's preparing for the Olympic Games. You need to also be like a farmer who's going to sweat, who's going to work, who's going to wait patiently for the work of the Lord to be manifest in this world. You're going to work hard, and you're not going to see the results right away. Be like a soldier, like an athlete, like a farmer. Later on in that passage, he says, present yourself to God as an approved worker, someone who's able to rightly handle the word of truth. Later in the text, he says, be like a clean vessel, like, a, like an instrument that's ready to be used for God's glory, that's not dishonorable, that's not messed up, that's completely ready and useful. With the trials that God will bring into our lives, don't miss the opportunities that he's giving you and I to be useful for him through those trials, to be useful for the next person, to be the comfort for the person who's going through it themselves. Obviously, looking back on trials, maybe some of you are looking back on some of the big trials of your life, and um, maybe we missed some of the opportunities to grow in godliness, but I don't want you to miss them today. Even if you feel like, with some regret, maybe you did miss an opportunity to grow in godliness, I want you to continue to say, how can, how can I learn from that? How can I grow in godliness? How can I help the next Christian? How can I help the person right now who's suffering in the same way? What can I do this week practically to be an encouragement to them? We can look back on those trials and hopefully be thankful. Like Spurgeon was quoted with this, attributed with this quote, right, that says you should kiss the wave that throws you against the rock of ages. That for some strange reason that you can be thankful for the hard things that God has put you through. That, that takes a lot of faith. It takes a lot of strength. I think that's the goal here. If you look back on the pain, you can be thankful. It's like I'm, I'm thankful that my parents made me get braces when I was 14 and um, not make me figure that out when I was adult. Uh, you, you know, maybe you've gone through some kind of painful surgery or maybe you had braces before. How, how did it feel when you got braces on your teeth? How did that feel at the beginning? What was the first day like? I love doing youth ministry and saying, oh, you got braces. How does it feel? What have you been eating? Oh, well, applesauce and shakes, right? Not much of anything. My teeth hurt. At the time, maybe you've experienced this as a parent. You've brought your kid to the place, and you know this is going to be super expensive, and they're going to hate it. Like, why am I doing this? Can they just have crooked teeth? Right? Maybe you've had this feeling before. But some of you have persisted and pushed on, and your kid gets braces, and they're upset, and they're complaining, and maybe they don't even wear their rubber bands, and it takes longer, and it costs more, and it's this all-around painful experience. But what was the end goal? What was going to happen? Well, the goal was perfect teeth. You might say, well, they don't have perfect teeth. Yeah, but they were exactly right. Like the idea of the, the, the shaping and the pain and wearing the rubber bands, all of that was meant so that the teeth would be in perfect alignment, that the bite would be exactly right, and they'd be as perfect as they can be. That's the picture that he's giving of perfect. Sometimes we think of the word perfect and think, oh, sinless or, or with, without any error. That's part of the picture. But the other picture is mature, perfect, set right, exactly what we need to be. Hopefully we can look back on our trials and say, God was fitting me as a tool and an instrument in his hand to be exactly the sharp instrument that he was going to use in this church to help the people in this church who need it. When Paul and Barnabas went through a bunch of cities where they planted churches, they were encouraging the people this. They needed strength. We just studied this in Acts 14. Acts 14, 22, it says that the disciples, they are... Paul and Barnabas, they went through the towns, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying this. This is the tagline. This is the summary statement. Through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. I love that summary picture, because that's the message this morning. Through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. God has wisely ordained trials for us to go through, but the end goal is exactly where God wants us to be, the kingdom of God. So let's decide ahead of time to count these trials joy when we otherwise naturally would not respond that way. Let's pray that God will give us the faith to do that. God, we are thankful that your word instructs us to understand that this is not something we'd come to by experience without your wisdom. We pray that for all of us, this is kind of a scary sermon to hear and a hard passage to preach because it, it's likely that you have some major trials for us that we're going to face soon. 
Pray that because of this text and because of the work of the Spirit that you do in our hearts, that we be ready and prepared, equipped to face these trials with joy. I pray that we decide ahead of time to have the right attitude and perspective on these trials, whether they be big or small, whether we think they're life-altering or even insignificant. I pray that you would get glory through our response, through our conformity to Christ, and also through the usefulness that these trials will bring about in our lives. Please use us to continue to build your church. I pray that you'd get glory even through our suffering. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.